On behalf of family, I welcome you all. We're here to celebrate the life of William John Cryer. Will was born on August 28, 1962, and he left us on January 30th, just a few days ago. Will was a beloved friend, a wonderful father, a wonderful husband, and uh, just somebody we want to celebrate today. We're going to be led in worship by our pianist, Elaine Duchesne, and then we'll take time to share memories and reflections. But please join us, first of all, to worship. Will was a very active member of our congregation, and uh, he sang with us every week, just as we will sing now. Won't you join me? What a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Yeah. 
ever wonderful to me. King of all days, oh, so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together together worthy, all together wonderful to me, and I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross, and I'll me that this next song was one of Will's favorites. It talks about going through the mountains and the valleys of life, but when God is in that mountain and on the valley, in the valley and on the mountain, it's just okay. Life is easy when you're up on You've got peace of mind like you've never known. But then things change and you're down in the valley. Don't lose faith for you're never alone. For the God on the mountain is the God in the valley. God of the good times is still God in the bad times. The God of the day is still God in the night. You talk of faith when you're up on the mountain, but the talk comes easy. When life's at its best, but it's down in the valley of trials and temptation, that's when faith is really put to the test. For the God on the mountain is the God in the valley. When things go wrong, He'll make it right. And the God of the good times is still God in the bad times. The God of the day is still God in the night. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound 
that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. So many thoughts and so many memories uh, racing through our minds right now, but to uh, help us to get a sense of Will's life and uh, what he meant to so many of us, uh, we're going to invite Mr. Don Hughes to uh, bring the eulogy, and then he'll invite uh, perhaps one or two others to uh, share that time with him as well. At the close of that, we'll enjoy some special music brought to us by Elaine, but uh, please at this time, we'll ask Mr. Don Hughes to come forward. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I'm honored to be asked by Will and Charlotte to, uh, to say a few words about Will. Uh, you know, when you read, uh, he was born, uh, I, I find out he was born just before sunset on August 28, 1962 in Edmonton. He died January 30th of 2017. He was the son of Pearl and Lewison, also known as Weso Cryer. Doesn't really do justice to the man. Sure, that's the statistics, but that's not the man. He had two brothers, Lauren and Keith, foster sister Monica, and survived by many more nieces, nephews, and friends. And, and the fact that we're all here today is a measure of his influence that he had in, our, in all of our lives. There's a lot more to him than that. And I found out as I got to know him and talked with Charlotte, and she allowed me to access some of his autobiography, um, and, then, and her remembrances to create this narrative. So I, I hope that I can, through these words, paint a picture of the man, Will Cryer. He began his life um, in a log house. He was born in Edmonton in the hospital, but he, he went with his family, to his, with his mom and dad, to their log house that was uh, built on some land that was given to them by um, uh, his grandfather. And he, he, re he records in his in his writings that the, it was a log house with gaps in the walls and in the roof, and the gaps were filled with mud. And, uh, uh, and he said it was, it was uh, miserable when it rained because the mud would, of course, or the, the dried mud would then become liquefied again, and so it would drip into the house. And, and he said that it would, uh, it would just create misery, and, and it was uh, not very nice to walk around in there on the floor. And, and uh, his father built a stove out of an overturned laundry tub. And the air was difficult to breathe, as he relates. And, but he said it was better than nothing. And, uh, and so that, that homestead that was on that land 
was near Masquachis, and I hope I said that correctly. It's a Cree word meaning, meaning bare hills. We used to know it as Hobima, but the Cree word is really more significant. The farm dogs became his exploration buddies as he investigated the area around the house. It was thick with trees and brush and Saskatoon berries. And so he traveled there with, his, with the dog, or dogs, however many were around. And one day on his tours, he relates that he found a particularly good patch of Saskatoon berries. And so he was uh, dining on them, enjoying them. And uh, uh, soon he had a partner. It was a bear that ambled over and... Excuse me. He ambled over and sat down beside him. And so they, the two of them, the bear and Will, feasted on the berries. And he said that uh, it was a special time for him because he had this feeling that, that, we, that we were both mildly curious about each other, is what he specifically said. And we were so close, but we weren't threatening to each other. Even the dog was quiet. And so after they feasted for a while and, and enjoyed each other's company, it would seem they, one of the dogs or the dog nudged him and said, as if to say, well, it's time to go. And so they got up and left, and, and he turned around and looked, and the bear went one way, and he went the other way. And he said, quote, I view this, I view this place where I grew up, much like the Shire the hobbits lived in, end quote. So you get a sense of his, his, uh, his creativity and, his, and the way he looked at life. Um, he was an amazing man. He went to elementary school just like others his age, yet things were not easy for him there. Um, he was put into the residential school system for three years. And, uh, and, there were, there were, and he was there with many of his peers. He relates they were the most challenging times of his life. First was the forced learning of English and its mandatory sole use. He could not use his native language at all. Secondly, oddly enough, is my left-handedness. I didn't even know he was left-handed. Not entirely sure. I'll back up. It's because he could use both hands so well, I guess. Not entirely sure if that was an endemic religious belief, and these are his words, or simply an outcropping of Latin, where everything on the left is sinister. Suffice it to say, I lost my first language fluency. Still, the greater challenge with the residential school is the crushing loneliness. I am surrounded by fellow Native children, but very few accepted me as such. Some of the Catholic staff were nice, but they were mostly indifferent. It is here that I learned that, that hate is not the opposite of love. It's indifference. To allow a human condition to sort itself out, to turn one's back on a situation where even just a word could drastically improve the outcome. This isolation and indifference had one unexpected consequence. Quote, I spent many hours in the library reading books on every subject I could find. It brought with it an interest in places other than Obima, with peoples other than my own, with a new view and a curiosity of what's over the horizon. I was one of the few students who watched the Apollo 11 lunar mission in July 1969. That brought with it a sense of grandeur. And now we get a sense of what he sees in his life and, and, the, and the vision that he had for his life and for the life of his family. There was a whole lot more to this blue planet than I could ever experience, he said. Some thought I was being horribly impractical at best, yet I soaked up the experience. From the year of my birth to this day, it was pivotal in human history. Yet those around me were far more concerned with booze and other interests. Yet the beauty of math, calculus, and science, and the accomplishments you can gain versus the allure of booze and welfare and the enslavement they guarantee is hard to fathom. Even when he was in hospital and not feeling well, I would visit him and read to him from Discovery Magazine. Uh, we had some choice moments together discussing things that I had no idea what they were, but he did. He knew it. Uh, he could talk about things from genetics to quantum physics, from simple to complex. His attitude was, if it's there in the world to discover, then I will discover it. And he did. 
He tells of an experience he had with the Northern Lights one night. And Charlotte related this to me. And Ed, I'm not going to, to tell you about that one, but you can talk to Charlotte about it afterward. But he found himself wrapped in the warm embrace of God. And it was loving and it was profound. And it changed his life. He knew that he was not alone. He got to know his extended family in his teen years. He writes of watching the Rose Bowl on television on New Year's Day with his grandfather that he hadn't seen for many years. I asked him if I could play football like that. He said, yes, as long as you both study hard and practice hard. Both became critical choices in my life, although at the time I thought it fanciful. End quote. He attended high school in Pinocchio. The principal was Halver Johnson, some of you may remember him, who went on to become a cabinet minister in the provincial government. He took a personal interest in Will's life and encouraged him at key points in his life. He worked hard and he was an honor student. When he graduated among the seven awards he won was the Schmidt Clam Award, and the inscription reads, the Schmidt Clam Award presented to William J. Cryer, whose character exemplifies a spirit of exploration, discovery, and stewardship, beneficial to the earth and its people. Will writes, quote, I watched as my dad wiped a tear from his eyes. It's the only time in my life that I truly felt his pride. in me, end quote. Will was what you might call a normal sized kid, I'm told, until he was about 16. And then he became not normal, as we all know. <laughs> well, not in size anyway. He exploded in growth and eventually became six foot eight inches tall and weighing about 280 pounds. Hope I got that right, Charlotte, yeah. And uh, I remember the first time I met him, I went with a friend and I waited outside his front door, and I stared at the largest shoes I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> and I thought, the guy who owns those must be huge. And so we rang the doorbell, and the door opens, and my premonition was absolutely confirmed. He filled up the entire doorway right up to the top of the jam. Not only were his feet big, and, but his, his hands matched. And yet he was a kind and gentle man, such as I've rarely met. For a guy of my height, I'm six feet tall, uh, hugging Will was like trying to hug a big and gentle bear. He was just so big, I could barely get my arms around his shoulders, much less anywhere else. And the only way that I could actually even get a partway hug to give him one was to actually stand on the stairs two steps higher than he was. And then I could kind of get there. Even then I was on tiptoes. His after school activities trans transitioned to football and by the time he was 20, Excuse me. He was a formidable force on the football field. Obviously, I would hate to run into him or have him run into me. He and his friend Keith played junior football with the Edmonton Huskies. They also tried out at training camp for the Edmonton Eskimos. About that time, he and Keith went to a dance club in downtown Edmonton. Keith had plans to be, a dance con uh, be in a dance contest with a nice girl that he'd met, and he invited Will to join the party. As they waited, Keith said, there she is. And the beautiful 23-year-old young woman walked in all by herself. Will told me that he heard a, vo a clear voice say to him, she would make a great wife. Charlotte was 5 feet 4 inches tall and 105 pounds soaking wet. Still is. And so she walked up to, we to Keith and Will. And when, when introduced to Will, and you can imagine this in big, and you'll see it in, the, in some of the pictures, this very large... Uh, uh, height difference and weight difference. She said in a quiet and forceful way, she said, friends always. And Keith and Charlotte, uh, Keith and Charlotte danced well and, and won that contest that night, but she also made time to dance with Will. And so their friendship began. And they were friends always. Little did they know, though, that that night they would soon be spending their lives together. Charlotte, Will, Keith, and Sarah became fast friends and did lots of things together, movies, nightclubs, dancing, and just hanging out. 
Will played football with Charlotte's brothers and all became best friends through that sport. Will and Charlotte's relationship grew and they became engaged. He wanted to provide well for his family and he saw education as the, as the, uh, as the answer. But where to get it? Charlotte suggested that he go someplace interesting. Like where, he said. She said, well, how about Florida? And she knew people there who would give him room and board and hey, it was a whole lot warmer than Edmonton. So off he went. He stayed with the uh, Joan and Willie Woodson and their boys, Stephen and Ian, and they were very accommodating of his very large frame and I'm sure his prodigious appetite, but it didn't matter. They loved him being there and he loved being with them. While at the University of Miami, two things occupied his mind, his studies and football. He played as a tight end on the, on the Hurricanes football team and that experience stayed with him for the rest of his life. He remained a Hurricanes fan. He had the Hurricanes jersey, the colors, everything. He really loved that team. Another time when they were dating, they went horseback riding. His horse gave him some difficulty and he dropped back out of the group. Charlotte looked around and wondered where Will had disappeared to. He rode up soon after, face as white as a sheet, tongue out, and a very pained look on his face. He said, now I've got three Adam's apples. He had a close encounter with the saddle horn while trying to get the nag to do what he wanted to do, but she didn't want to do it. But he never gave up. He carried on. He came back to Edmonton, and he and Charlotte were married on <clears throat> October 4th, 1987. They had an interesting discussion about their honeymoon, Charlotte told me. It was either, do we have a big fancy wedding, or do we go on a, a nice honeymoon? They chose the honeymoon. Eight weeks in Fiji, New Zealand, and Australia, even snorkeled and scuba dived in the, on the Great Barrier Reef. And they both had a lifelong passion for the, for the ocean and its, and its marvels and wonders. He still wanted to, to further his education, so he and Charlotte moved to Toronto so Will could attend the aerospace engineering program at Ryerson University. There's that, that interesting part of his life where he if, he, if he thought he really wanted to do that, he didn't let anything hold him back. He wanted to, to pursue it. But after one year, they decided that Toronto was not the place they wanted to be. So they moved back to Edmonton, where Will went to the U of A and earned an honors degree in genetics. They lived in an apartment for, time, for some time and, and then bought a house on Heath Road, which became the family home until the present day. While furthering his education, he worked for the First Nations at Hobima, as it was then known. They liked his work ethic, and he liked doing the work. So he changed his focus, enrolled in the electrical trade. He became a journeyman master electrician, and his path was set for his life. He worked in that trade until illness no longer permitted. Both Will and Charlotte loved to travel. When Jordan joined the family in 1993 and Jaya in 1996, they would go on trips together whenever possible. At times it was just Will and Charlotte, but whenever possible they'd go as a family. The world was there to see, and they wanted to see it. Cuba, the U.S. including Hawaii, they went to Mexico, Bahamas, the Cayman Islands, Greece, Italy, Malta, Cyprus, Turkey, including the beauties of Canada. Holidays were not just sitting around the pool or the hotel and going shopping, they were for explorations and adventures. They hiked and boated, rode horses, canoed, cycled, rented a houseboat uh, and a motorhome. Once when on a bike trip, one of the spokes broke free from the wheel and jammed itself into the front wheel of Will's bike. Instant face plant, as any of you have ever had that experience. The road rash was severe, but ever the good sport, all he said when Charlotte rode up and saw the aftermath of the spill was that he had sacrificed, quote, sacrificed his face to the gods of concrete, end quote. They and the kids went to Disneyland, Disney World, Epcot, SeaWorld, Knott's Berry Farm, and Universal Studios. They liked bowling and skiing and snowboarding. When Jordan was involved in baseball and swimming and Jaya was deep into track and field, he was there with them. Charlotte pursued her interest in dance, jazz, belly dancing, and salsa, and yes, Will learned how to salsa. I would like to have seen that. Once Charlotte was sick for a week and she was going to miss her class in belly dancing and so Will offered to go to the class and videotape it to take back to Charlotte so she wouldn't miss the key parts of the instruction. He loved ball hockey and he built lasting friendships with his ball hockey buddies. 
Charlotte told me that one night the play got a little aggressive, as it does when you've got a, a bunch of testosterone-filled guys playing hockey and, and all wishing that they were in the NHL. The play got a little aggressive, and one of the players jostled him a little too much. Will gave him a well-placed check and sent him flying. Not hard to do for a guy who was almost 300 pounds. That player was one of his police buddies. He hoped he didn't cause him any lasting injury. He was a good cook, and he loved to do that and enjoyed relaxing with his friends and uh, with, a, with a good meal and good company. He also enjoyed the challenge of fixing things. He was the neighborhood go-to guy to get something fixed and repaired. Electrical work, construction, washing machine repairs, anything and everything. If it could be taken apart, and it could, then he could do it, take it apart, fix it, and put it back together, and it worked. And there were no pieces left over. Always a wonderful thing. Will's father-in-law, Gordon Bowen, once said of him, if, quote, if Will can't fix it, no one can, end quote. He loved to laugh. His favorite movies, his favorites were movies of people doing stupid things, like the vacation movies with Chevy Chase, or the movies of Adam Sandler and Melissa McCarthy. They were guaranteed to tickle his funny bone, and he laughed uproariously over those. He was kind and considerate of others, and even though the last two and a half years were very difficult, he always had a ready smile. His quip was always, and you remember this, no doubt. He was also a considerate husband. On a trip to Zion National Park in southern Utah, Charlotte had taken lots of pictures. It was a four-hour tour through spectacular canyons and rock formations. If you've ever been there, it is really something else to see. When they were done, somehow the camera broke and all the pictures were lost. Will turned the car around for his sweetheart and went back so she could get the pictures she wanted. No complaints, no filing the favor away to get a favor later, just a man who cared for his sweetheart. And would do whatever he could to make her happy. He lived through an ordeal that few of us will ever endure. He was diagnosed with kidney cancer two and a half years ago. He suffered the surgical remover, removal excuse me, of his left kidney. Within a year, the cancer had spread to his lungs. More surgery to remove a third of one lung and the tip of another. Then it spread to his brain. More surgery. During the recovery from that, he had a pulmonary embolism and almost died. Ever the fighter, he came back in strength, only to have the cancer come back in the same way. He had gamma knife surgery at the Tom Baker Cancer Center in Calgary. But the cancer continued to grow and became too much for his earthly body, and it took his life on January 30th. As terrible as it was, it, in a way, it was a blessing. How is that? I and you have become acutely aware of our own, thought, our own lives and our own families and our own relationships and their value to us. We're in this room today because of his profound influence on our lives. That is a blessing. And will always be. I got to know Will because of cancer. I was diagnosed with tongue cancer about the same time as he was diagnosed with kidney cancer. I remember seeing him in the Misericordia Hospital. I had met him once before on the doorstep, as I, had, as I described previously. This time, a friend asked me if I would stop by to see him in the hospital and offer any help that I might, that I might be able to. I walked into the room, and I was greeted with a hearty hello, like we're old friends, a firm, warm handshake. And there he was, this huge man, almost seven feet tall, jammed into this bed that really wasn't built for any, anybody larger than six feet. His feet were hanging over the edge. And so we had a good laugh over that. I was still, pardon me, I was, I, I was struck by his good humor then, and I, and I continued in that, and his kind demeanor. He didn't let things wear on him. He didn't let his disease wear on him. Life had to be lived. 
and he lived it. I visited often and continued visiting with he and Charlotte, and, and the days and the weeks turned into months and years. We became friends. I watched him fight this insidious thing within his body, all the while fighting a similar thing in mine. We gave strength to each other. We laughed together. We, we hugged and cried together. We truly loved each other. William John Cryer, I know. I know you live on. Because our Lord and Savior Jesus lives, I know that you live. On that, to me, hangs everything. Because Jesus lives, we will live. If the measure of a man is the legacy of love and kindness that he leaves behind, excuse me, if the, le if the measure of a man is the legacy of love and kindness he leaves behind, then Will, you are a giant. The ancient Hebrews believed that our names are not just our personal identifier in this life, but they are also a title, an expression of honor, and they are also the evidence of a covenant between us and our ancestors, our family, and God, our Heavenly Father. Our names are important. He knows us by our names. He always remembers us. I will always remember you, William John Cryer. Of this, there is no doubt. Thank you. Charlotte. Don spoke of uh, Will's laugh, and it really was something. I remember the first time I really heard it. I was, I was at home, and he was at his house, and I was reading from an ethnic joke book. And I said, Purita Ricens. And he said, what? And I said a second time, Purita Ricens. He said, what? Third time, I said, Purita Ricens. He said, do you mean Puerto Ricans? <laughs> and he, he laughed so hard, I gently put the phone down and tiptoed away from it. As Don said, he was a big guy. At, our, at my high school reunion, this one guy, Jack, was giving me a lot of trouble and ribbing, and Will just picked him up by his feet and held him upside down. My hub was my hero. He always took care of the bugs and the spiders. Once in Australia, there was a spider bigger than his hand, and as big as his shoes were, he killed it with a tennis racket. A different time, we were swimming in Fiji, and all of a sudden, I saw a black and white snake. And my hub was like a tree because all of a sudden I climbed up on him and I was literally standing on his shoulders holding on to his head. <laughs> and he didn't even see the snake. I just saw it, you know, squealing away. So like I said, he was my hero. Last night I found some of his writings and I thought I would read uh, what, some of what he said in here. He says, just like Dawn said, that voice he heard, when I walked in the door, he heard she would make a great wife. He heard that clearly. And he said, and then of course, uh, his friend Keith said, there she is. And he thought, great. <laughs> but anyway, and, and when he stood up, one thing that he didn't mention, I, as he kept rising up, I did say, friends always. And he said, and I had very long nails. He said, look at those blades. Yes, friends always. <laughs> 
And he says that I held that in my heart and will forever. Yes, just friends at first, hoping for more, reassured by that voice and its message meant solely for me. All good things are worth waiting for and fighting for. With the passage of time and the evolution of our relationship, I grew ever more appreciative of Charlotte, not just for her beauty, but for her, her personality, her quirks, her warmth to the point that life didn't make sense without her. I didn't make sense without her. My days slowly and exorably began and ended with her, that voice impossible to ignore. My existence gave her safety and security. If any of her dates got out of hand, well, there I was to step in if needed. If proposals came, they were compared to me, Mr. Steady, Mr. Reliable, Mr. Guardian of her heart. Anyway, I can guarantee you that all her bows hated me. If I were at a club or a party, she would end up spending inordinate periods of time with me, sometimes just sitting talking from early evening to the last call to closing time. Charlotte was the primary reason I went to Miami. I tried out for both UCLA and BYU and was declined for the position I'm used to playing, which was slot back or tight end. So in a leap of faith, I applied to the U. I received conditional acceptance for fall of 86. I went to Miami only a week after we got engaged. I got to Miami, registered and tried out for the football team as a straight walk-on. I made the team as tight end on the fourth string. The things I miss most about my time there are that lift of, and high you get from the crowd. The desire all had to be associated with the team. You got invites everywhere, no doors were closed to you. All those intangible things that go with celebrity. I'd gotten accustomed to girls flaunting themselves at all of us football players. If I'd been interested in that, there was no end to it. But in my mind, Charlotte was it and we were getting married. I hate to end my narrative here, but I do so in the assurance that on that December night, my life began. I scarcely think of any point in my life without somehow thinking that she was there, that somehow, some way, we were connected, and it's this connection and my Heavenly Father's presence that guided me to not only this point in time, but into all points following it. I've had challenges since, but through her presence, her help, they've been just ripples. In one of life's great ironies, I haven't changed, but I know I'm not the same. I thank my Heavenly Father for bringing me here. We would like to ask now if anybody else would come up and like to share an experience that you've had with Will um, in your lifetimes and, and uh, anything that would be uplifting for all of us, please come forward. Thank you so much. And I hope everybody could hear that clearly. I was one of his hockey buddies, and I remember, you know, playing hockey was, you know, good sport and stuff like that. And I remember, you know, everybody's going and they're at it and stuff like that. And then I remember at one play we made, bang! I said, Will, why did you knock me over? I didn't knock you over. I was just standing here. <laughs> and he had just that nature, you know, like just so loving and like a big teddy bear. And uh, he was also in one of our small groups. And, you know, we got to know him deeply. And, yeah, I truly will miss him. Thank you. I was, uh, wasn't planning to come up because I was afraid of embarrassing Charlotte. But I just wanted to say that Will 
was just another reason for me to say that I have never feared huge men. Because all he, all he was to me, he was not a big scary thing. He was a massive squishy hug and he was so much cuteness interacting with his wife. And I'm one of those weirdos that lurks on the corners of things. So seeing stuff like that helped me to draw closer to other people in a way. And I had some of the same similar sort of background things and now I see from what I've heard some of the same interests as Will. And so now I understand why he used to listen to me babble and actually seem interested. <laughs> Thank you. Would anyone else like to share something? Yes, sir. Oops. <laughs> Will was a good friend of us. Charlotte and Will came and before they get married and separated at our, at our place. And we had two boys. They were young. My younger one was a kind of rubber one. My mother-in-law called him Tornado. But Will was there and playing with him. He said, oh, that's what you just got. And he pulled him. He said, oh. he, he left my son with his one arm like that. And he said, that's just what you got? And my son tried to beat him up and stuff like that. And they just enjoy each other. And my kids love it. They couldn't believe the first time they saw Will, how big he was compared to my husband. My husband's just six foot three. And Will was just, oh, wow. And my son, my two boys, they just loved to play with him when he was coming to my house. It was just a, a treat for them. Thank you. Please come. Just look how many of you are here. Some way, somehow, you got connected with Will or Charlotte. We were expecting maybe 250, 300 people. Nobody really knew. I don't still know what the numbers are. But doesn't this speak very highly of someone like this? I have one thing that connected me with Will, and I spoke to him one day, and I says, I had an uncle, my mother's youngest son, she was the youngest. In 1936, an American basketball team went to Germany. He was the tallest man on the team, six foot nine, and Will's just one inch shorter. When you get that tall, it doesn't matter too much, I guess. But anyway, I could relate a little bit to him, and I still have a strong feeling of closeness in that sense, and like the rest of you, he'll always be in our minds, in our hearts, and it's just great to see how many people showed up and willing to spend the time here and recognize someone that affected their life. Thank you. I was in a small group with Will for a number of years and I got to know him really well. Uh, I was always just amazed by Will's insight, his knowledge. He knew everything about anything. It didn't matter what it was, you just turned and said, Will, what's the answer to that? Will had an answer. Didn't matter what it was. And it was just, didn't have to pull my phone out of my pocket, didn't have to look anything up. Will was there. Just ask Will. But beside that, he had an exceptional sense of humor, and he was deeply engaging, and he just had a warmth about him, and he just felt comfortable in his presence. And one of the things I was really grateful for was I never, ever saw Will get angry. I never saw him lose his temper, raise his voice even. And when you get that big, that's something to be really, really grateful for. He was a great man and a great friend. 
thank you. Um, I'm Jay as uh, one of uh, Charlotte's and Will's dance instructors. I know you guys heard uh, that he did dance, and he actually did. It wasn't actually something made up or anything like that. Um, it, was, uh, it was interesting seeing in a couple of different buildings that we taught out of. Uh, one of them had a bit of a low roof, so when you walk in, I'm like, oh, okay, it's a little bit low, but that's cool. And I turn around and look at the students, like, da 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 da. And it's like, the ceiling's here, Will's head's about here, and I'm like, oh, this will totally work, yeah. <laughs> and then I look at the part, and it's, I'm like, oh, okay, this, this is totally a thing that you can make work. But it's, dance is an amazing thing because uh, people can talk, but when you move with someone, you get to see how what they feel about themselves, how they feel about their partner. And um, seeing him, Will dance with Charlotte, it's... There's a, there's a compassion, there was a love um, there. It's just the way that he carried her and danced with her, looked out for her, obviously, right? Um, but, but we all know that, but there's, there's just that, that tenderness there that was there that you can't teach, you can't make up. Um, and I think that was a beautiful thing to, to be able to witness, so. Thank you. My name is Thomas. I uh, had the great fortune to meet Will and Charlotte uh, probably shortly after Charlotte met Will. And she used to come into the clubs and, you know, she was like a little sister. And uh, she introduced me to Will. She says, you got to meet Will. And uh, so the first time I met Will, he was driving, <clears throat> I believe it was a fire, uh, Firebird, and he had the biggest whale tail on this thing that you've ever seen. Now, the tail was so big that the car kind of sat like this until Will sat in it. <laughs> and then uh, the next time I met Will, he was driving a pickup truck, uh, a Chevy, but for some reason the truck looked very small. And uh, we went for a ride in the truck, and I'm sitting there looking at this truck, and I'm thinking, the truck is a normal size. Why does it look so small? But mainly it was because of Will. His presence uh, was larger than life, and he was a very large fellow. The last time I saw Will, uh, I was coming out of Costco, and I hadn't seen him in Charlotte in many, many, many years. And I hear this voice, Thomas. And I'm looking around, and here's Will standing there with his son. And I looked at Will, and I said, Will? And he says, Thomas. And we talked about this and that, and uh, at that time, he informed me that he was going in for an operation. And I was actually happy to see him, but I was sad to hear that uh, he was going in for an operation. He achieved a lot of things in his life. And today is really not a sad time. It's actually a joyful time because he's gone on to a much better life without pain. But while he was here, he touched a lot of lives, made a lot of people smile, did a lot of wonderful things. And I'm going to miss him. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to? Oh, one more. Yes, please. Hi. My name is Morris. Um, I'm one of Will's cousins. This is kind of hard for me because <clears throat> I kind of I kind of came in in Will's life 
when he met Charlotte. So I was kind of hearing things about Charlotte when, we were, when I was growing up with Will. He'd always talk about how much he loved her, talk about her all the time. They'd be like, who's this Charlotte? <laughs> He'd be like, I really like her, man. I'm like, God, who is this woman? I must meet her. So we finally met. And uh, well, he always loved her. He, he'd always talk about her. Whenever we were together, he'd always talk about her and how much he loved her. I could tell that. And <clears throat> you guys talk, you know, Will's, Will, you guys talk about Will with the hockey, the football, anything physical. I was the only guy who could take Will's hits, and I hit him back. Uh, I always found that funny, but <laughs> the thing is, um, when, when somebody spoke here about how much influence Will had on us, Will was, I'm six foot four, and I always considered William my big brother. The funny thing is, is that uh, he had a big influence on me. It was always, whether it always be cars, movies, um, <clears throat> he was always my hero. And he always will be. <clears throat> as Keith and Lauren know, I was always in their lives as well, Charlotte, you know. But as time goes on, we become men. And men become, you know, we have our own families. So I became a man and had my own family. So. From time to time, I'd run into Will. From time to time, we'd joke around. We'd talk about playing hockey again. Um, all those things. And like I said, Will is my hero. He was always, to me, he was always a big brother. Whenever we talk, we talk about Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, he's, he's going to be missed. And everyone coming out here, I just figured, um, because he's my cousin, he's family, Lauren and Keith are family, Monica's family. Um, you talk about him being for education. He always encouraged me. He always, I always encouraged him. Still, we always had that good relationship. <clears throat> but all I can say is that I'm going to miss him. I'm sure all of you will miss him. Uh, I'll miss him the most because he was a big influence on me. And he always will be. Just like my dad was a big influence on me. He'll always be there. He'll always be part of my heart. But I'll tell you a funny story. It was between my mom and his mom. See, I was, I'm from Hobima. Will took me to uh, my first actual movie away from my parents which was Back to the Future so anyway we had to take the late show and my, mo my mother was kind of hesitant at letting me go because she, she saw Will you know, six foot eight you know, Camaro, bad influence <laughs> so anyway back then you didn't have any cell phones so you had to pay for them but uh, anyway at the, end of the, at the end of the night told Will thanks, you know, thanks for the movie, it was great, but I came home at midnight, oh boy, there was my mom waiting at the door, I walked in, I went to bed, then the next morning, uh, I saw Will the next morning, because I had a summer job, I was working with him as an electrician, so anyway, Will tells me the next morning, guess what, I said, what, your mom called my mom, <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> So it's kind of funny because she, apparently my mom and her mom, his mom are just arguing back and forth. Your son kept, kept my son out late. Well, yeah, you know, as mothers do, they tend to fight. They had an exchange of words, but other than that, you know, we both chuckled. It was, it was funny. But anyway, I won't keep you. I just wanted to say I'm going to miss him. And he'll always be my big brother. Thank you.
And thank you all for your courage and, and, uh, and sharing your insights into Will's life. Pastor Bob? have all been answered I finally arrived the healing that had been delayed has now been realized no one's in a hurry there's no schedule to keep we're all enjoying Jesus just sitting at his feet if you could see me now I'm walking streets of gold if you could see me now I'm standing tall and whole if you could see me now you'd know I've seen his face if you could see me If you could only see me now My light and temporary trials Have worked out for my good To know it brought him glory When I misunderstood Though we've had our sorrows They can never compare what Jesus has in store for us, no language can share. If you could see me now, I'm walking streets of gold. If you could see me now, I'm standing tall and whole. If you could see me now, you face. If you could see me now, you'd know the pain to raise. You wouldn't want me to ever leave this place. You wouldn't want me to ever leave this place. Never leave this place if you could only see me now. Some wonderful recollections and memories. <clears throat> I got a few of my own I'm going to share for a moment or two. I knew Will for the last 20 years or so, had the privilege of uh, being the pastor of the congregation he attended. But uh, I think it was about probably shortly after my wife died, he asked me to uh, meet up one day for breakfast. I said, uh, so what's really on your mind? He said, I just want to get to know my pastor a little bit better. Okay, that's cool. From then on, I remembered that breakfast was the most important meal of the day. And uh, we met up uh, quite a few times. And uh, when we were in a small group together, it was a breakfast group. So uh, we uh, always managed to combine uh, good fellowship with good food. But we moved through a series of stages in our friendship over the last 15 years especially. I uh, got to know Will as an electrician and that was interesting to me because as a child I was traumatized by electricity. I couldn't understand it and in England where I grew up we don't mess around with this 120 volts, it's 240. 
So uh, on the occasion that my dear mother was cleaning out a toaster with a metal knife, um, and she somehow or other arced something, I think they call that technically, uh, she leapt up in the air and landed on me, and I was traumatized by that little event. And I, I told Will about that, and he said, well, it's not too mysterious. You can overcome those things. And I said, well, you know, and I really couldn't fathom it in physics class either. And, of course, Will had a very sharp scientific mind. As you heard, he did a degree in genetics, an honors degree in genetics, and uh, there wasn't anything technical that he couldn't fathom. But... Uh, there came a time when I uh, was uh, building a, a, a unit, a rental unit, and I asked him for some help, and uh, he took out the permit and then uh, had an old, wise electrician uh, actually do the work. And this old, wise electrician uh, explained to me one day that uh, you could learn to do these things if you really wanted to. And he said, you know, anybody can really pull wire through holes, but... Uh, that's what you have apprentices for. He said, it's a journeyman who places things into the box. And I said, well, Vic, that's interesting. And uh, a little time went by. And uh, Will asked me one day, he said, you know, every now and then I really get jammed up. Would you consider just the odd day, you know, every now and then, would you consider helping me if I'm jammed up? And I said, yes. And so one day he had uh, occasion to... Uh, make a contract for 10 houses that had to be uh, wired up, just the basements. It wasn't a huge thing, but it involved uh, putting together uh, the, the wiring and just bringing it all together and putting it in the breaker box. And by then I remembered the words of Vic, and, uh, and I'd seen a few others at work. And I said to Will, I said, uh, you know, you know, you're going to be uh, calling me every now and then just to help you on a day. I said, do you think one day that you'd let me wire up a breaker box? And he looked at me and said, sure, you could do all ten. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's cool. I suddenly leapt through three years of apprenticeship, and uh, I'm on the verge of... Uh, of course, I went back and told Vic that, and he thought that was complete heresy. But... <laughs> This was an illustration of uh, one of Will's many gifts. He believed in the deep end, of man uh, deep end theory, the deep end theory of management. You want to do a little something? Well, why don't you do a lot of it? It's, it's okay. Uh, nothing can go wrong, really. I uh, had one dear lady in the congregation ask me if I knew anybody who was a competent roofer, and I actually did. And so... I organized uh, these guys, and uh, one thing led to another, and they did her roof and the neighbor's roof and then their garages and a few other things. And uh, one morning, uh, they made an early start, and one of the roofers named Danny uh, had uh, noticed that there was a long piece of wire on the roof, and uh, it had to be removed along with this old aerial. So uh, I think it was early on a Sunday morning, he just dragged this thing across the roof, and somehow or other, he broke the overline, overhead line that was going into the uh, house, which, upon reflection, could have been a complete and total disaster. He could have taken his life, which, in, in irony, again, Danny's dad was also an electrician uh, contractor back in Ontario. And I said to Danny, well, you, you've, you've done something really serious. We're going to have to get somebody competent on this. So I called Will. And uh, Will came over, and uh, I said, what are we going to do? And he said, well, there's, there's nothing to it. All you do is take one end, and uh, you put it next to the other, and you, you put it in this little thing here, and then you crimp it together, and it's back. I said, well, are you going to do it? Said, no, you're already up on the roof. Uh, <laughs> just, just put it together, and here's the tool. I said, well, you remember, Will, that I am afraid of electricity. Yeah, but... You've wired in a box already. You, can, you know what you're doing. And so I, I crimped these things together, and he said, now that's, the, that, that's what you do when you, um, you splice a cable. I said, well, when am I ever going to splice a cable? I don't know, but people dig up cables all the time, and they break them. And sure enough, one day he called me up, and he said, you know, uh, I just had a call 
uh, for the Alexis Reserve, and somebody dug up a cable. Do you think you could go out and splice it for me? I said, okay. Uh, he said, I'm really jammed up. And uh, so uh, I got the tool, and I went out there. And it was January, and it was minus 25, and I sat in the bottom of a ditch, and the, and the cold sort of worked its way into the south end of my anatomy. Uh, but I, I did this, took a picture, sent it to him. Oh, very good, very good. And, and uh, I'm really grateful you did that. And he called me several other times. I noticed he always called me when it was minus 25. <laughs> and, uh, and it was only, you know, I've only done it four or five times in my life, but if any of you ever need a cable spliced in July or August, I'm your man. <laughs> but it was nice times like that that caused Will and me to uh, bond together. Uh, Will was a great bargain hunter. Um, Will believed that God invented the Internet so that you could research for spare parts far and wide. And uh, I believe that uh, by the time a dollar bill left Will's hands, the uh, Queen's eyes were bloodshot. It, it was, it was, and, and he was just great at bargain hunting. And there were several times, and he, he liked to drive... Um, let's say classic pickups, meaning they're older than 12 or 13 years, and pieces would fall off. But when he needed spare parts, of course, now he's stranded. He doesn't have a vehicle. So there's a couple of occasions he called me up and said, uh, look, I'm stuck. Uh, have you got a couple hours that you can give me? And so I, I picked him up and drove him out of town to the middle of what seemed nowhere, and there would be a man working in a shop by himself and out back he would have the biggest pile of junk you've ever seen but in that pile of junk would be the great treasure that Will needed. Uh, it was a transmission. It was something or other he needed to make his truck go again. And lo and behold he found the bargain. Uh, he uh, was not enthusiastic about playing retail. Let's put it like that for new parts. And he could research and find things, as I said, on the Internet that God had given for those who liked to hunt for bargains. And little, little things like that kind of endeared him uh, to me. Um, as we would trade stories, uh, he told me all about playing football in Miami. But the, the interesting thing to me was, as he described it, he said, you know, halfway through the year I got homesick. And I said, well... It's Florida, and home is Alberta, and it's January, and you're homesick. And he said, uh, yeah, he said, I, re I really missed my brothers. I really missed my mom. I really missed Hobima. I said, well, it's Miami <laughs> and Hobima. <laughs> now, there's nothing wrong with Hobima. I mean, I lived in Red Deer for some years, and I used to cheer for the Hobima Hawks. Um, and, but really, January... Miami? Really? Yeah, he said I was really homesick. And I, I came to understand that uh, about him. I know there were several occasions towards the end of his mom's life that he uh, asked me to go with him and visit with her, and uh, we would uh, talk. He, he would, being still pretty competent with the Cree language, he always, it seemed to me, talked to his mom in Cree, and, uh, and he would ask me to pray with him for his mom towards the end of her life. Uh, and uh, she was very, very precious to him, as uh, were his brothers. I couldn't understand about the brothers, but I could understand about mom. But they were very, oh, it's okay, Lauren. It's just a little humor. Just, just a little humor. So he was, to me, the, the consummate family man, you know, a very accomplished athlete. I, I found it funny as uh, people talked about bouncing off of him. Uh, Will referred to that as... Uh, introducing them to the welcome mat. <laughs> How you doing down there? Welcome. And that, that, was, that was just the, 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 the gentle way he put it. Yeah, athlete, bargain hunter, gifted entrepreneur, um, eternal optimist. I mean, any time he invited me to participate in something during the frost season, there were only ever two or three inches of frost. And anybody who lived in Alberta long enough to know that two or three is actually two or three feet of frost. But to Will, I'm sure there's only two or three feet. It's, you know, it can't be that bad. Well, Will, it was. It was.
Uh, it seems like yesterday that uh, we met for breakfast, and uh, he, he put the report in front of me and said, uh, can, you, can you read it? Can you s figure what it means? And it, it meant cancer. And uh, I, was, uh, I, was, I was stunned by that, young, healthy, vigorous. And we took quite a while to talk about it. And he said, I've got to go home and explain this now to my family. And uh, he said, I want to pray for strength. He was, he was quite unique. He was quite special. Nobody quite like Will. Nobody in the world had the same fingerprints, the same DNA, the same voice pattern, the same combination of experiences, the same successes, the same failures. He was, he was unique. Nobody has ever in all of creation be like him. And at a time like this, we ask ourselves, well, well, what happens to all of that experience, all of that love, that passion, that skill, that insight, that knowledge? What happens to that life? In the Christian tradition, uh, we refer to our Bible. And the oldest book in what we call our Old Testament is not Genesis, it's the book of Job, the oldest book that we have. And interestingly, it addresses the oldest questions we have. Uh, it's a little difficult to read at times. It sort of belongs to a, a type of literature that uh, we don't have anymore, at least not in this way. It was called pessimistic literature. And it uh, was extant at the time. It was a way of looking at the negatives in life, the challenges of life, and that's why you read things like uh, in Job chapter 14, uh, the thoughts of a man who's under great distress. And he expresses it this way, man who is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. Now, if that's all you read, you'd be pretty discouraged. So that's not much promise in that. But after expressing the frustrations with the temporary nature of this life. And Will certainly expressed his frustrations with the temporary nature of this wife, life. He said simply, this experience sucks. And who wouldn't disagree, who wouldn't agree with that? But nonetheless, the person who is experiencing this um, says simply, Oh, that you would hide me in the grave, that you would conceal me until time has passed, that you appoint me a set time, and then remember me. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my service I will wait until my change comes. You will call, and I will answer you. You shall have a desire to the work of my, your hands, for you number my steps, and you don't remember my shortcomings. In fact, my failings are sealed up in a bag, and you cover over them. Now, this is the conclusion of a man contemplating the nature of life, and no one ever came to the end of their life saying, wow, that's enough. Well, I, I, I guess I'm gonna, it's just time to leave. All of us would like to see our loved ones linger with us a little while longer. Um, all of us, even as we age, continue to think of ourselves as somewhat young. In our mind's eye, we do not think of ourselves as ready to leave or ready to die. And yet this man contemplates it in the midst of his distress and suffering and then concludes, wait a minute, my life is the work of God, and I am the handiwork of God. In fact, God will remember me and call me forth from my grave. Now, that's why in the Christian tradition we are buried in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection. And Will lived in that tradition and with that faith, whether it was the love that was seeded into his life and by those who served him in his youth, 
and he certainly learned something from Catholic Christians. He had good friends who were Mormons. Uh, we continued in our fellowship and our friendship, and we shared the Nicene Creed. That is to say, we shared the same idea of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We shared the same God as our Father in heaven. And that's the way we'll refer to his God, the one he prayed to. And over the years I knew Will, especially the last 15 years, he grew in the knowledge of God, and he grew in the grace of God. And he learned that uh, his successes were a great blessing from God, and even his failures were experiences, learning opportunities that centered him back into God's will. And he lived in the reassurance of God's grace. Even though he understood that it's appointed for us once to die, he also believed sincerely that the judge of all mankind is Jesus Christ, our Savior. We are told simply uh, it's appointed for all of us eventually to die. And after that, the judgment. Sounds ominous, depending uh, on how you uh, choose to pronounce the word. But the good news is that the judge of all humanity is Jesus the Christ, who gave his life for all of humanity. And in that reassurance, Will lived, and he rejoiced. In the book of Thessalonians, Paul invoked that hope. He said, finally, friends, we urge and exhort you in the Lord that you should abound more and more, just as you have received. That would be great if I was in the right book of Thessalonians. It's very confusing. Paul wrote two of them. If he just kept life simple, it would be much better. Anyway, his reassurance is all of us shall be called forth in the time of the resurrection. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow, as some sorrow, in hopelessness. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who are asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means go before those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise. We're called up in a resurrection because all of us are designed and built to function through a body a body that fades very quickly. But we are given the promise of a spiritual body, an everlasting body, a glorified body, Paul calls it. In very simple terms, uh, a fallen creation needs to be renewed. And Will was renewed in his mind by the presence of the Holy Spirit. He was renewed in hope. We sometimes call that being born again coming to life spiritually. And in that life, he anticipated also a body that will be granted to him at the resurrection that will be just as everlasting as his mind, as his spirit. And we anticipate that together. We look forward to that time. In the book of Revelation, looking to the end of all things, and looking to not just the renewal of our bodies, not just the granting of everlasting life, but of a renewal of all things. John wrote, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first had passed away. And then I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It's just like a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying that the dwelling of God is now with men. He will dwell with them, they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, nor crying, and there shall be no more pain, 
for finally the old order of things will be passed. Behold, I make all things new. Right, for these words are true and faithful. We are aggrieved today and we are saddened today because some things pass. And it is a great blessing that all that will was will live in our memories, in our hearts. But we too will pass. The greater blessing is that will, along with all of us, can be granted everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Savior, through his sacrifice and through his gift, his gift of grace, his gift of salvation. And that means that not only will he live forever in your hearts and in mine, but he will live forever and we along with him because he has accepted that promise made to him. So many beautiful memories, and we're going to gather together just in a few moments, enjoy lunch, share more thoughts, uh, probably remember more funny stories, uh, give thanks for a life that was a blessing to all of us. And certainly uh, it's been said if you die with two or three close friends, you are greatly blessed. I think within the many hundreds here today who acknowledge and respect his memory, there are just more than two or three close friends. He died a richly blessed man, but he died also in the hope of everlasting life, a continuing blessing that even now we can't experience, but are destined to experience. Let's bring our hearts together before God's throne and, uh, and pray. Our Father in heaven today, even as we lament the passing of a dear friend, a dear brother, a dear husband, a dear father, someone who was a blessing to all of us in some way or another, we are reminded of the fact that still there is life everlasting for him. There is the promise of a resurrection to everlasting life. There's also the promise that he is safe with you until that time comes. We thank you that he is beyond pain and suffering and already gone into glory. We ask that we can capture that same vision, that we can follow in the same pathway, set forth by Jesus Christ, our Savior, in his own life, death, and resurrection. We ask that we can enjoy our time together, share fond memories, but also be just a little changed at the thought that we've shared today, that we can prepare ourselves for eternity as well, just as Will did in turning his heart towards you. So we thank you for his life. We thank you for his memory. We ask your blessing, and especially your protection and guidance for his family and those who feel his greatest loss greatest today. And we do this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Just a moment, we're all going to rise and we'll sing a closing song and the ushers will uh, take the family out and uh, seat them uh, first after the song. We'll be seated for just a few moments and then ushers will lead the rest of us out. But uh, let us at this time stand Bob, video, video. I beg your pardon. One thing I forgot. We have one final reflection, okay, uh, a video that we have prepared. And after that, we will sing together and enjoy fellowship.
We apologize and thank you for your patience. Sometimes these technical things just don't happen.
Now I'll invite you to stand as we conclude our service this morning, this afternoon.